Hello, everyone. Um, great to be here in Belgium, in Brussels, talking about drugs um, again. Um, and what a great morning. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, the policing of cannabis and um, of drug possession, drawing on a research study and uh, an international review of the literature. But before I sort of kick off with that, um, I want to... The organisers asked me to say something about innovation in the drug field and to take a personal perspective on that. And I welcome that because it's allowed me to think about the last sort of 35 years, of which time I've worked as a researcher and a research funder in government, in the Home Office, the Home Affairs Department in the UK, and um, at a large national charity, the Joseph Roundtree Foundation, and then finally at the University of York with about sort of 10 years in each. So it's been good to look back over that period of time and over which I've very much tried to bring research evidence to bear on policy in particular, but also practice, um, with a view to changing things for the better. And I have to say that's largely been a failure. And I want to, but we can learn a lot from things that haven't worked so well. I want to share two examples um, over, that, over that period of my career. And the first of those um, was at the Joseph Rowntree Foundation um, back in the mid-2000s, where I set up um, the independent working group on drug, cons drug consumption rooms, as the report, the Purpley Report. And um, in doing this, we brought on board a whole lot of very respectable people. It was chaired by Dame Ruth Runciman, and we had senior police officers, a barrister, professors, a bunch of people that I felt the government had to listen to, really, or that the government might listen to. We did a really good job of reviewing the research evidence that was available at that point in time. And we put together, I think, a, a very clear, accessible report that made recommendations for piloting drug consumption rooms in the UK. And that report came out in May 2006. We also sought to prepare the way politically so um, we met, went into government departments, we met with ministers, we met with senior civil servants, these elusive people <laughs> that we've not been able to have with us today. Um, but we went into departments to meet with them and sort of pave the way. And the noises were good. You know, their response was positive. And I really felt we were on the cusp of success and that we would get our pilots. And then the Labour government of the time in the UK received some of the worst results in local polls, in the local elections, about the week before our report came out. It wasn't really predicted. Um, they did extremely badly. And the political space for change vanished overnight. Um, and our carefully crafted report and recommendations were swiftly, bluntly, unthinkingly rejected by the government. The second example I just want to touch on is our evaluation of 10 drug recovery wings in the UK. These were units in prison set up to support prisoners who wanted to make radical changes um, in their substance use before release. And we found mixed findings, really, for the wings themselves. Um, and the most important, but the most important conclusion we concluded was that the majority of pr prisoners, um, including people who've made real strides in their addressing their substance use problems alongside other problems, were just 
let out of prison with no support whatsoever. So despite all this work done in prisons, they were just shoved out the door with 50 pounds, well, it's about 50 euros now, in their, in their pocket um, to sink or swim. And we felt extremely angry about that and horrified by that. And we set up the Ex-Prisoners Recovering from Addiction work group, EPRA, which is that other report on the slide, um, where we were trying to produce blue, where we did produce blueprints for women and men in, being released from prison with, with previous um, drug problems. Um, this is how we should do it. So they, they were blueprints for you know, getting the accommodation right and so on, which was absolutely critical actually for so many of these people. So um, Lord Patel of Bradford chaired this group. So what is it about the English and lords and ladies? It's peculiar, but these, you know, these two individuals are absolutely fantastic uh, with long histories of working in the drug sector. And you know, the report was released with great fanfare in the House of Lords. And um, we had really nice supportive comments from the prisons minister of the time. And again, we'd gone through that process with policy makers and there was a lot of interest in piloting our blueprints. And then we started getting reports from Wuhan about this seemingly not very serious virus. And of course, we all know that story and what happened. And in the UK, prisons just shut down um, with the prisoners still in them, of course, <laughs> but they shut down with regard to engagement with anyone from outside. And, and again, that, that window um, slammed shut. So both examples show how these windows of opportunity do arise, I think. And I think we can do something to force them open to some degree or encourage them to open. But, you know, events can um, stymie such efforts and these windows can slam shut really quickly. I think they demonstrate also how the immediately responsive and performative nature of politics is often at loggerheads with the slow and careful development of evidence-based innovation. And that's really my game. And maybe it is a bit of a game, as Carl pointed out, but that, that is what I've sought to do. But it's um, elephantine in comparison with the speed and dexterity of politics. I don't think it was wasted effort. And um, I'm proud of the work we did. And I think it's fed into future endeavors and current endeavors. Um, and I hope we see radical changes um, in those two areas looking to the future. So in the remainder of my talk, I want to turn to the main topic, um, which is the, our research on the policing of drug possession. Prior to 2018, when this research kicked off, despite the salience of the issue, um, there was no research on cannabis, cannabis policing in the UK and hadn't been for 20 years. So there have been loads of debate about class, reclassification of cannabis in the UK, loads of talk about policing, loads of fears about young people's drug use, um, but there'd been no research, which was a shock to me. Um, and, and so we applied for funding for our quite detailed study of cannabis policing in North Yorkshire, in the North Yorkshire Police Force. I should explain that that is a very rural and in some senses peculiar police force, <laughs> covering a huge area. Um, it's the largest surface area, the largest um, police force area um, in the country, with a lot of rural areas and small towns. We um, got data on 4,500 um, drug possession cases, and we interviewed 41 police officers about their possession, not about their possession of cannabis, about their policing 
of cannabis possession. That did crop up in one or two places, actually, their own experiences. Um, and that was a pleasure to go out and uh, interview these officers. I did quite a few myself and um, out to some of these rural police stations and police stations in towns like Scarborough and York in the north of England. And what always strikes me about those um, interviews with officers is their, how candid they seem, how open they seem. And they have a certain confidence um, and will tell you all sorts of things that a lot of other practitioners don't. Um, so we did those interviews and we analysed that data. And then the other thing I want to draw on here is uh, a, a review of the international research on the policing of drug possession. Again, this is something that hadn't been done, and I was quite surprised by that. Um, so um, I undertook to do it. And I found 55 relevant articles. Uh, I sort of locked myself in a darkened room. I read them and coded them. That's the sort of thing academics enjoy, I suppose, and I did quite enjoy it. <laughs> and a number of themes come out, really, from, both from that review, um, but also um, from the research. And one of these themes, um, so sorry, I'll run through these themes. Accidental nature of possession policing, which I'll explain. Police officer views on the importance of upholding the law, kind of whatever the consequences. International research evidence on the impact of drug possession policing, what are the impacts, and uh, policy change. And then at the end, I'll go on to say something about how things might change in the future. So, the accidental nature of cannabis policing. When we looked at these four and a half thousand cases and interviewed police officers as well, we found that cannabis possession was most frequently detected in the course of unrelated policing activity. This was not proactive policing. This was kind of reactive, hence the accidental. So they might be patrolling the streets and they smell a whiff of cannabis smoke or what they perceive to be cannabis smoke or indeed herbal cannabis. So many of the officers talked about the strength of the smell of modern herbal cannabis. And more frequently, most frequently, um, cannabis was discovered actually in car stops. So these would be stops because a, a rear light wasn't working. Um, there was a suspected traffic violation um, and they stopped the car. The driver wound down the window and out came a cloud of cannabis smoke. And the, officer, the officers would then um, search the individuals concerned and the car. Worth pointing that out, that all the guidance in the UK states that smell of cannabis is not sufficient grounds for a search on its own. Um, and we found that that was flagrantly, flagrantly ignored by many officers. Um, other cases frequently were revealed in the police station. So they'd been arrested for something else, another offence, and then, you know, there's a very careful searching process in, in the police station, both for officer safety and for the safety of the people concerned because of fears of suicide attempts. So they're carefully checked out, carefully searched, and cannabis is frequently found. And then they're charged with that <laughs> offence. So it's completely accidental. I remember one case where a um, young offender um, was going into court for a magistrate's appearance on a completely unrelated offence. And um, now in the UK, probably in Belgium too, there are metal detectors for people going into courts. And um, his, he walks through the, the arch and there's a ping and they search him and they find well, what I would call a stash tin. And I, I very much doubt that he called it a stash tin, but a metal container with uh, herbal cannabis in it. And he was charged with that offence. So a completely accidental um, discovery. 
Um, and I think, uh, th Alex has touched on this, I think this reflects what I describe as the ubiquity of drug possession. So extrapolating from our self-report surveys in the UK, there are probably about 140 million occasions of cannabis use each year. So, and those people are in possession of that cannabis. So, this is an extraordinarily common thing. People are walking the streets everywhere in possession of cannabis and in possession of other drugs, of course. And so, if the police were to randomly select a bunch of people, stop and search them, and they do not randomly stop people, <laughs> I should emphasize, then they would find quite a lot of people with drugs on them in their pockets. So it, it's hardly amazing um, that, that it's appearing in this ac accidental fashion. When turning to the interviews, when we interviewed officers about um, their practice with regards to cannabis possession, um, to our surprise, they reported formal action in nearly all cases. So the old days of um, dropping cannabis down the drain appeared to have disappeared, and earlier research had found that to be common. All of the officers pretty much, um, except in a historical case, I remember some talking about it in the past, but in the present, they said they always took formal action. It's the legal. End of the day, that's my job, and I will police it. And for some, there was a sense of threat if they did not. I'd always do it by the book because it's my job. I've got my mortgage to pay. So a real sense that they were being observed and their policing was being evaluated. And in the UK, again, I'd be really interested to hear if this is the case in Belgium, police officers are increasingly in contact with their sergeants, with their police managers in police stations in real time. So they're often being asked, so what are you doing now, John? Uh, well, I've just picked up this. And there's this exchange. And so they're fearful that they will do the wrong thing and it will be, um, their supervisor will become aware of that and they will get in trouble for it. I would also say that there's increasingly clear guidance on what they should do. So in common with many other, other areas of policing, there's almost exhaustive guidance um, on what they should do in particular circumstances, um, which I think does um, attack some of the areas of discretion that the policing has, has traditionally had. When asked about... Um, so we asked them about what impact did they think their cannabis policing had. And this caused real discomfort for lots of them. It was a question they clearly never considered. And, um, and they responded, some of them, in terms of, well, it's against the law, and therefore, you know, my job is law enforcement. That, that I can't really engage with point in any other way. So it was really, I was really surprised, actually, how sort of unthinking this area was for them. And we interviewed some senior officers, you know, really quite senior officers in North Yorkshire, um, and asked them about impact. And I wanted to share this um, interview um, section that, that, um, that I actually did. So I asked, what do you think the impact of North Yorkshire's policing of cannabis is on offenders? Interview side, the interviewee side. I then asked, on the people that are policed? Silence. I'm getting quite uncomfortable at this point. Are you likely to be reducing their cannabis use? I doubt that very much. I doubt that very much. So there was this sort of reluctance to engage with this question of the point of their policing, the impacts of their policing. Um, and it came like a surprise to them, really, that they had to think about this. Turning now to this 
international review, um, this review of international research um, on the impact of drug possession policing, not just cannabis. Um, being dealt with for cannabis possession can significantly erode trust in the police. This is perhaps the most important finding from the international literature. And this is research done in UK and Australia, primarily. So drug possession, I like this quotation, is one of the offences that is most likely to bring people into adversarial contact with the police. The scope for erosion of police legitimacy is obvious. If the laws that the police most frequently enforce are regarded by the police as unreasonable and unnecessary, it is unlikely that police powers will be regarded as legitimate. And this is really important if one considers many of the first um, engagements with the police for young people will be in this sort of area. And then, of course, there is the gross overrepresentation of young black men among those stopped and searched on suspicion of drug possession. So in 2022, the rate of black people stopped and searched was seven times the rate of white people, and it's been like between seven and ten times higher for a long time now. And despite the enormous upset that this has caused and the damage to people, it has not changed. We need to remember that 60%, in the region of 60% of stop and searches are for suspected drug possession. So this lies at the very heart of disproportionality in stop and search and its impact on black communities. And of course that has a major impact on relationships between the police and black communities in the US, UK and elsewhere. And I think there's something about the being stopped and searched, being found to have a small amount of cannabis or some other drug, and that sort of accidental discovery becoming, they may well be searching for knife possession, which is you know, a real fixation in the, Met, in, the, in the Metropolitan Police in London, and they then take that drug off that person. Whatever they do, you know, they may give them a cannabis warning if it's cannabis, they have various disposals, but they take the drug off them too. And I think that causes real, you know, aggressive responses from people on the street quite often. Um, and then it often extends through, you know, and then, then it can end up in arrest. There have been few studies of the social impacts of possession offences. Some evidence of negative impacts on employment, um, on um, relationships within families. So, you know, you, hear, you read about young people being charged with cannabis offences and then taken back to the family home. So they may receive a caution, and then they're taken home, and the parents are told. That can really damage family relationships. <laughs> and, you know, it can be way more of an intervention than a caution. Um, and then also evidence of some, some impact on accommodation, if it's a conviction. With regards to police crackdowns on drug possession, we need to remember that crackdowns are mainly around drug markets. But in Vancouver, there was an effort to pick up people and um, police uh, drug possession, um, particularly Class A type drug possession. And uh, this was evaluated, and the more vulnerable users, the people that are in public space or on the street, were way more likely to get policed and have their drugs confiscated. In terms of impact, there was no impact, other than they had to go out and buy more drugs. So no evidence of people ending up going into treatment, um, evidence only that you know, they needed to replace their drugs which they then went and did. A common reason that's given particularly by the, by the police for retaining the power of arrest for drug possession is the likelihood of 
uncovering more serious offences. And this was a, an argument used against cannabis becoming a non-arrestable offence in the UK um, back in the two, t early 2000s. The available evidence, and I should stress there ain't, there ain't much, there is very little evidence, um, suggests that this is very unusual. So in less than 1% of simple cannabis, by simple I mean not possession with intent to supply, so simple cannabis possession offences led to discovery of more serious offences um, in a, UK, a detailed UK study. So this appears to be rare. There is a small amount of evidence that intensive stop and search um, can lead to reductions in drug possession. And I suspect, and the authors suspect, that this is because people who are in an area where lots of people are getting stopped and searched all the time hide their drugs better. Well, what are you going to do? And so I think, you know, the enormous amount of resources that have been poured into these intensive stop and search efforts have resulted in more uncomfortable drug users. That is my conclusion there. Turning to policy change, a sizable proportion of the international research um, has focused on this. Uh, the Lambeth experiment in 2001 um, was um, uh, an experiment where the one division of the Metropolitan Police um, in Lambeth took it upon themselves to confiscate cannabis and give formal warnings rather than arrest. And the aim here was to de decrease the amount of police time spent on this. There was really limited evaluation evidence, which is kind of unforgivable <laughs> because it was a really, you know, as an evaluator, they weren't doing it before and then they started doing it and then they stopped doing it. So it was a gift, um, but there was no sophisticated evaluations. But what evidence there was um, showed that police time had been saved. There seemed to be no negative effects. But then, you know, this policy window thing, it, the media started speaking very negatively about this, and particularly about Brian Paddock, who was the um, commander in charge of Lambeth, and quickly it became politically unacceptable, and um, it was stopped. Some of the most detailed research on the policing of cannabis um, is, was undertaken by M Tiggy May and colleagues, who she's now at Birkbeck College in London, um, before and after the temporary reclassification of cannabis from class B to C um, in 2004. Despite lots of media fears that were really stoked up over this period, Mayatel concluded from, quite ex from extensive research that reclassification to class C had a smaller impact than advocates of the change hoped for and than opponents feared. The most intensively studied change in drug possession policing um, was the order maintenance policing policy in New York in the 1980s to 90s, which Alex has referred to. And this really was the aggressive policing of cannabis possession, um, with this focus on marijuana in public view offences, MPV offences, and the evaluation evidence showed that there was real disproportionate impact on black and minority ethnic communities. So 52% of MPV arrestees were black, and they made up 23% of the population. They were more likely to be detained than white suspects, convicted, and receive prison sentences. So those are real impacts on the black community in New York. Um, and the similar findings for stop 
question, frisk. That's the American version of stop and search. More recently and more positively, cannabis decriminalization and legalization in US states has been associated with substantial decreases in racial disproportionality in possession offenses. And these are the graphs that Alex showed us this morning showing um, declines both um, in arrests among white and black um, suspects, um, uh, but big declines for both, but still something of a difference between them. But that is a positive um, finding, and some research has suggested that the gap is much, is really quite uh, close. You know, the gap is quite small. Um, and lastly, I wanted to refer to this research from Mexico, um, where they found two evaluations have ha found how the decriminalization of dr drug possession in 2000, 2009 has been associated with less arrests of people who inject drugs, but on the other hand, assaults, extortion, syringe confiscation, and coerced sexual activity has been reported by users um, policed in Mexico. So decriminalization is not always an unallied good um, in this particular situation. Um, and Russia too, um, there are those sorts of problems, which are problems about policing, ultimately, whatever the legal status of the drug. And I would say, you know, for users in Mexico, um, the police station may have offered some, some sort of safety compared to their treatment on the street. So the inescapable conclusion for me is that policing drug possession in a UK style does much more harm than good with negative impacts on individuals and this undermining of police legitimacy, which goes much wider than um, the question of drug possession and influences how the police are perceived, how f whether they are perceived to be fair, which is a fundamental part of police legitimacy and the public's unstated agreement to abide by the law. So this is... This is fundamental stuff. And moreover, as our research in Yorkshire has shown, police officers see little worth in this activity of picking up people for cannabis possession and acting on cannabis possession. But they remain determined to enforce the law despite that. I, it struck me as just so interesting that they didn't see any problem with this. <laughs> in an in interview, they would say both of these things. We enforce the law. Yeah, there is no point in enforcing the law, but we enforce the law without any sense of that being difficult, really. So how might things be done differently? So... I'm going over some of the material that Alex talked about this morning, but that's sometimes quite helpful, I find. <laughs> so, um, we have legal approaches. Based on the US evidence, cannabis decriminalization is likely to reduce many of these harms. In particular, the perennial social ill of racial disproportionality. Uh, that feels like a really good basis on which to make that change alone. The decriminalization of possession of all drugs will impact on vulnerable Class A drug users as well, decreasing their criminalization in countries like the UK, although the street policing of users in countries like Mexico and Russia may not be improved. And, you know, I think... I am speaking for the UK and many European countries in thinking about those positive impacts. They're more complicated in other countries, I think.
And then there's de facto approaches. Policing level approaches don't require um, legal change. And we have diversion to education, treatment, harm reduction by police officers. And, you know, this, I think in the UK we've got quite a lot of these uh, projects. Um, Alex is, you know, more of an expert here than I am. But there's a willingness among many police forces to take this action. They're picking up homeless, drug users in possession of heroin, crack cocaine. They don't want to take them back to the station, really. This is a, this is a better outcome for many officers on the street faced with these situations. So I think they are quite popular. I think there may be problems from my reading of the, of, of the evaluations that have been done so far with a mix of people referred to diversionary projects. So I think one of the projects in Bristol, in the UK, in England, um, was finding, you know, that cannabis users and heroin users and all sorts of people getting referred to a um, diversionary project. And the people in that drugs project then had to try and deal with this very different bunch of people, um, which is hard to do. I think there may also be, among some police forces and police officers, senior police officers, assumptions about the motivations to cease drug use or change drug use. This feels like a positive thing to do. Let's refer people to treatment. Let's refer these people with long histories of, of addiction to Class A drugs to treatment projects. Quite a lot of those people don't want to be referred to treatment projects. They don't, want to, they don't want to be arrested and convicted, but they don't necessarily want treatment. Um, so I think it's easy to make assumptions about what people want, and maybe some of the harm reduction interventions will be less attractive to some police forces. And then there's this idea of not taking action, ceasing to stop and search on the grounds of simple drug possession as opposed to intent to supply, which I think we're some way off, and also to take no action if drugs for personal use are found in the course of police action aimed at other objectives. I feel that, the, especially in the Metropolitan Police, the amount of anger in certain communities there um, sh gives the opportunity for the police to take quite radical action. There's a Labour mayor there who might be also quite conducive to that sort of approach. So I feel, you know, that maybe a window of opportunity <laughs> will come along at some point whereby the police can cease to take what is meaningless action to them um, but could have a big impact on the people that it affects and the communities where the police focus their efforts so strongly. If there was ever a time for a government to introduce radical change, it is certainly not now, at least in this weird country that I now live in, in the UK. Policy windows are all firmly shut, it feels, at government level. I don't think you can think about anything other than the economy at the moment. Um, and so the, but there are hopes for change, and those hopes for change rely on local developments, um, which I hope can be carefully evaluated and then introduced across police forces without the need for legislation. Introducing things across police Forces is a bit glib, actually. Now I read that again. Um, in the UK, at least, all the police forces are fiefdoms. They're sort of um, proud of their independence, proud of their own approaches to things. So standardisation in the UK of anything to do with policing is highly problematic. 
So um, I shouldn't be so glib about that and assume that this, this, these things can be rolled out. So I've talked a lot about this international literature, a, a bit parochial about the UK and what's going on there. And I really hope um, maybe after the formal sessions today, I'd love to hear more about the situation in Belgium, which I'm terribly ignorant about. So if people want to come and share um, some information about the policing of drug possession, particularly in Belgium, I'd be really interested to do that. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this interesting research. And indeed, it would have been an excellent introduction for a political debate. But okay, maybe some very interesting questions can compensate for the not having the debate. Yes, please. Uh, uh, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Um, so we've heard for a long, long time how this disproportionate amount of stop and search, uh, disproportionate amount of stop and search by, uh, in the black community, you say six to ten times higher. And you also say this, the police have to have a legitimate reason to stop and search, and it can't be the smell of cannabis. So what do the police say as their reason for this disproportionate stop and search? Are they saying... Um, six to ten times more drivers of cars with broken headlights are black. I mean, what, what's their reason for stopping the car that just happens to be driven by black people uh, in their defence? Well, so with the cars, um, the, the stop is about potential traffic violation. So they're not stopping searching on the street, which those powers are sort of designed for. So that's a slightly different situation. On a, on a street location, they're, they're stopping and searching for a number of reasonable suspicions, is the phrase that's used. And they have to record, or are supposed to record, what that reasonable suspicion is. And so when I was talking about cannabis smoking not, not being, sorry, cannabis smell not being a reason in itself, that's because it's not one of those reasonable suspicions. So they tend to be stopping people because, you know, there's been a burglary in the area, they think they might be um, they might have equipment on them that they've been used, they might have stolen goods, there's a whole range of reasons, and in the Met, particularly suspicion of carrying a knife. And then drugs are often found in, in the course of that. Nonetheless, 60, about 60% are for suspe suspected drug possession. I don't know enough about, and it's not the research detail to know what the nature of those suspicions are. I think, in a lot of cases, they suspect that there's drug dealing going on. So their, their suspicions are around them being in possession of a large amount of drugs. They may have watched people and in a particular street location and they assume that they're carrying drugs. But I don't know. Thanks. I had a second question at the back. Yeah, and a third one. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Lord, for your presentation. My name is Louis Letellier de Saint-Just. I'm a lawyer from Montreal. Um, I was not surprised by your findings, though, because they could apply, I guess, everywhere in the world. Um, did you investigate in police schools to ask how they are working, what kind of approach they have to change this attitude from the police on the streets? Sorry, can you repeat that? Maybe, okay. Um, Did I ask the police officers that I interviewed how they might change their practice? Well, one, of, one part oh, of your, training, your presentation sorry, uh, was showing us the response from police officers when you asked them, what do you think about your actions? Arresting, for example. And they say, well, I don't have any choice. I have to apply the law. Mm. So they don't even think. They don't even make a research or ask themselves what their impact is. So my question is, what is going on in police schools? Yeah, sorry, I missed that. Yes, well, I don't know. Um, I, I, I'm aware that um, there is some talk of drug policing in the training for the police, but it's not a substantial part of, of their training. 
without a doubt. Um, and it will be mainly around, I suspect, Class A drug use and the options they have available to them. I very much doubt they're going to spend a lot of time talking about basic um, drug possession offences. Um, <coughs> any other questions? Yeah, there was one there. Yeah. That's, uh... um, I can perhaps partially uh, answer your question concerning uh, Belgium question mark because I did uh, research a few years ago specifically concerning uh, drug-related interventions in the festival context in Belgium. And uh, so it were both prevention, harm reduction, uh, policy intervention that we focused on. And it's, yeah, perhaps not surprisingly, but the, the, the results were similar. So like the no impact issue um, and also more harm than good, uh, and also when, when you were um, uh, showing the, the codes, it was also surprisingly similar uh, concerning uh, also police officers that I interviewed uh, were also not convinced of, of their actions, of, the, of their impact. Or Did you yeah. find that there was, that, that caused them any problems, any sort of anxiety that, you know, when asked they said it's not having any impact? Or were they similarly phlegmatic about it, like, like my interviewees? We, we, we focused on, on uh, if I remember well, six factors, like using less or more uh, drugs instead, uh, using other um, substitutes, this kind of things, but not in the sense of like it, if it has an impact on family. We didn't go deeply on that. But yeah, also more good and harm, let's say, that's the main uh, conclusion. Yeah, I should yeah. say that, that some officers did feel that their, their intervention could have a, a, an impact in particular cases. So particularly, many spoke about like first-time users, young users, where they would, um, if they came up against a police officer, um, this might put them off their future drug careers, with some quite naive sort of assumptions about mm. nip it in the bud and they won't end up on heroin, um, that sort of stuff. There was also one officer who said that every time he picked up a young person in possession of drugs, he took them into the police station and strip-searched them as a lesson, as a, as a, as a preventive. Now, you know, police officers sometimes tell these stories, I think, to get a rise out of researchers. But I think at least in the past, this officer had, had you know, used his discretion to, to take people into a police station and strip search them once found in possession of drugs, particularly young people, which was, of course, horrific to us. I can add here maybe one thing, like the the searches, the drug searches, uh, especially then if it's really the naked uh, body yeah. search, that it has, of course, a huge impact, especially on young people who yeah. have their first uh, festival, festival experience. And on the other hand, when, I, when we also interviewed older uh, festival goers, uh, it was more like, yeah, also the, the results that you showed, um, like, yeah, finding a better way to, to hide it uh, yeah. or another way to, to cope with it. Uh, but they, they will do what they do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. No difference. I think strip searching is a, is a terrible thing. It's, it's not properly controlled in the UK. It's not properly supervised. There's not proper guidance. It's psychologically really damaging. They use it more for black suspects than white, they use it for a lot of young people, um, and I really want to do some research on strip searches, but that is so sensitive that I don't think the police would ever agree to that sort of project, probably. Yeah. Okay, Thank thanks you. a lot. Okay, maybe one last very quick question. Yeah. Perhaps in the margin of all these uh, things, 
the education to become a police officer in Belgium only takes eight months and months and some uh, months of uh, practical uh, education. Uh, I don't understand why such an important job in our society doesn't take uh, the education uh, to be educated to be a police officer, mm. doesn't take much more time, for instance, like three years or four years, like most of the bachelor education programs uh, are programmed to be any kind of helper in our society. But nope, you are a police officer in only eight months. Uh, so if the education time would be longer, perhaps all those issues would have been better uh, educated. Well, that's a really interesting question because in the UK, there's been a process of professionalization of the police. And now to be a police officer, you have to do a degree. You either have to do a degree before you get there, it doesn't matter what the degree is, <laughs> or you can do a degree that's in policing once you become a police officer. So um, that's had mixed reviews in the UK. So like um, there's a lot of hard-bitten, experienced police officers who say the only degree you need to be a police officer is a degree of common sense. And you can imagine those sorts of attitudes. But it, it's really spurred me, this in the earlier question, spurred me to find out more about what they are doing in terms of the you know, intensive training, rather than the degree course, the intensive training that also occurs for police officers. It's not that long, but I would like to know what they do, on, particularly around these issues. OK. Thanks a lot for the interesting presentation. OK.